If you're a newcomer tonight, new in recovery, there's a few things that uh, I want to get straight right away. I'm not an expert on anything healthy. <laughs> I was on the radio in Chicago and the DJ, he says he was a normal person. Normal tonight means most. That's all it means. It doesn't mean better or more blessed. In fact, I think some addicted creatures are so skilled and have so many gifts, it takes us a lot of years to pay attention to what we've lost and the list of loss before we ever try to get help. That's why we get here late. Um, now, on the, on the other side of that, I've never seen anybody get to recovery too late or too old. Never. I've seen people quit too soon. So that being said, if you're in your first year of recovery, there's this thing called the 13th step that they want you to <laughs> stay away from. And I will, I will second that. Relationships when you're new, horrible 13 step. Go right to 14, that's banging an old timer. That is okay, that's all right. That's fine. Yeah, we want that to happen. You know who really likes that joke is old timers. They like that joke a lot, so. Now for the normal people, I got some for you too. Uh, there's a whole bunch of material I have tonight that's uh, for the two groups of people I'm looking at. I'm looking at two groups, always two groups. Um, 24 years of doing this. Uh, I got sober in 1988 and uh, clean, if that's your word. If you're an NAAA person, I, I got language that won't fracture anyone. <laughs> Amazing how we get so particular about words. You know, we'll survive years of abuse, but you can offend us with a sentence. <laughs> Mixed message there, right? It's like having a pitcher of margaritas watching intervention. It just doesn't really make sense, right? <laughs> Normal people don't clap for that. They don't clap for that. It, Sounds reasonable, sure, why not? Yeah, well, that's a tough show to watch, sober, yeah. Where? So, <laughs> that's funnier than hell, I've never said that on stage before. Uh, I like that, I'm glad we're recording tonight. We're making a film tonight too as part of the uh, uh, documentary I'm filming, it's called One Night at a Time, and um, the, the, the thing is that cameras uh, add 10 pounds. We got five of those, so I had to get back to my freebasing weight from the 80s. <laughs> Not a lot of normal people in this room tonight, I can tell you. But there are two groups of people on the planet, normal and the rest of us. Normal means most, and most people have a different language because of the experience they've had. Normal people don't display the behavior that the rest of us have. Normal people never drive drunk. Never. It's illegal. <laughs> I know, right? Look at the rest of us. Well, how far do you have to go? I mean, you know. And how drunk were you? There are levels, you know, 0.08, that's just getting started on a Saturday morning, and whose car was it you were driving, really? I mean, because we don't own a lot, right? Normal means most. Most people don't, uh, don't ever try methamphetamine, even if it's free. <laughs> I never understood that one, really. It's free, and you're not going to do it. No, no, that's, that's, uh, it's unhealthy. That's what I heard. See you later. They wouldn't snort methamphetamine because it's painful. Look at the rest of us. Well, to a degree, yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah! Oh, my eyes! Are... <coughs> What's that? Oh, God. I... Normal people would quit right there. No, I'm done. I got to go home. I... The rest of us go, can I buy some of that from you? I, 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 uh. Methamphetamine is actually a good weight loss product. Um, I tried it. I just ate quicker. Um, Look at the normal people. Does this ever get healthy, this show? Does that ever? <laughs> yeah. We have a different language because we have a different vocabulary because we have a different experience. You know, normal people, they hear the word tweak. It means enhance something. <laughs> the other people, the rest of us, we have words that don't work for normal people, and normal people have words that don't work for us. Normal people use words like hope. Adulthood, parenting, mortgage, 401k, retirement. <laughs> Look at the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, fine, whatever. The rest of us use words like allegedly. <laughs> Probable cause. And the four greatest words in the English language, sentences to run concurrent. <laughs> there are normal people that go, I saw that on Law and Order. Had no idea what it meant at the time. And, if you watch Law & Order, you get to see either some kind of a peripheral problem to the addiction uh, uh, population, or you get to see your past. Now, 
I know what you laugh at tonight will tell me who you are. It's not hard for me to figure out with all the material I have who's whom in the room. It's not, and that's not to out who you are, but I hope you're comfortable enough to know that you have a humor muscle that God gave you. If, if you're not a God person, don't let that word fry you, and I'm no threat to you. I'm, this is not church, but... I don't care when you get the jokes. Um, But this show, if you're Baptist, hardcore Sunday, go to meet in person every week, never miss, you'll love this show. It's kind, it's got heart, there's some substance to it, there's a place of grace I occupy. If you're a hardcore atheist, you're going to love the show too, and we're just going to say God bless you as you travel. So, <laughs> if you're agnostic, hey, whatever. I admire your casual connection and root for your eventual epiphany. Um, There is no threat to you today if you have a God, don't have a God, have a specific God. Uh, you know, I grew up Catholic, and, and because I'm divorced now, um, there's kind of a, a, a fracture there in the relationship. You know, my, uh, my ex-wife and I, uh, the plaintiff, she's a phenomenal person. <laughs> Normal people don't clap right there for that reference. Like, yeah, me too, man. Yeah, we got an annulment, which is the Catholics, uh, Catholicism version of the Lemon Law. And um, <laughs> you... Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. That's brand new and still a little painful, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, it's okay. I always know who the codependents in the audience are, too, because they have a mating call. They have a mating call. Aww. That's a codependent in heat right there. Yeah. Yeah, if you're a hardcore drunk or druggy and you hear, aww, you kind of think, Ugh. That's hot right there, man. They probably still got good credit and a fixed address. Yeah! Woo! Nothing hotter than good credit and a fixed address, man. And most of her own teeth. That's a bonus, too, right? You know. Now, if you're a meth person, that's not as funny, is it? No, really. No, no. Faith is like a toothbrush. If you use it regularly, there's lots to smile about. But, you know, the first time I ever came to Houston, I was working at a club. It's not around anymore, I don't think. It's called Spellbinders, and it was in the early 90s, and I had about four or five years sober. Clean, if that's your word, N-A. Don't get upset with me. If you're a normal person, we battle among the 12-step groups. <laughs> AA, NA, Al-Anon, Nar-Anon, Families Anonymous, CODA. <laughs> and if you're an NA, we just can't stand the word sober. Just can't stand it, even though we borrowed everything we own from AA, the original fellowship. It's really odd, you know. 1935, AA started everything, Bill and Bob, you know. This is kind of funny, too. If you have a big book, which is the, the, the biblical version of recovery, it's the book, right? Well, there are some things in there that are not accidental. My favorite sentence in the whole big book is, and then there is the voice that cries for sex and more sex. <laughs> That's on the top of page 69. True story. I think Bill and Bob knew exactly what was going on. Now, if you're a Christian Baptist, pray for me Sunday. That's okay. Look at all the transitional housing patients. <laughs> I'm going to read that book. I'll tell you that right now. 1935 AA began. 1953, 18 years later, Narcotics Anonymous started their very first meeting. Also the same year, Al-Anon began, 1953. Coincidence? I don't think so. But if you're in a recovery program or in a 12-step based fellowship of anything, why do we care? Why do we care? It's like forgetting you had grandparents, for God's sakes. It's just the nature of the beast, you know? AA and NA, very different. Alcoholic and addict, very different creatures. And an alcoholic will get to recovery very early, desperate, but beaten to the street. And they're depressed. Alcohol's a depressant. Why you would drink if you're depressed and add depressing to the depressant? No, I don't know, but it feels good for a while. <laughs> I'm an alcoholic. I know I'm a piece of crap. <laughs> I know I'm a, I'm a piece of crap. Can I have a drink? <laughs> a drug addict gets to recovery early and has a similar attitude with a little flair. I, I know I'm a piece of crap. I'm an addict. But so are you, every one of you. 
Come on! What? I need something to raise my spirits. Normal people don't laugh at that, but they pay taxes because of it. Um, normal people don't clap right there either. Yeah. yeah, raise my taxes. That fiscal cliff, it's right there. All the addicts are on the other side. First time I ever came to Houston, I'll get back to that story, because I am kind of uh, uh, easily distracted. I'm 53 years old, and I'm still easily distracted. And I'm like, hey, that, whoo, what was that? <laughs> oh, a snowflake. <laughs> when they start coming down, I might lose it. You might have to remind me. Anybody here uh, uh, in recovery, in therapy, and, and on staff at the hospital? All three of those combined. Anybody by applause? <laughs> no, we're all anonymous at this point, Mark. No, we. <laughs> We want to keep our jobs, and I haven't told the boss yet. I haven't told Matt. I used to shoot heroin into my nutsack. I'm very embarrassed about it. I... Aww. I know. <laughs> and maybe that was just me. But, but the thing is this. I remember the first time I came to Houston, I was working at Spellbinders, and uh, uh, I was riding with you. Okay, ma'am? I know, that, that nutsack reference kind of, it's, it's really unforgettable. Um, I hope some of you get that in church on Sunday. I think that's one of God's little teasers is when you get the joke in a place where you can't let them know you're getting the joke. I think he giggles like we do at our kids when they make a mistake that's not harmful. I think he looks down and he goes, <laughs> yeah, well, it, it just... It happens. That's all right. I forgive you. That's my job. But you can't explain it to the people in the pew next to you. <laughs> you weren't there. Never mind. So I was riding in the car with the club owner and one of the club managers. They had picked me up from the airport in Houston, and they were taking me through Houston to get to the hotel where the, you know, right next to the, the club there, spell, Spellbinders. And it was almost lunchtime. And we're driving along 10, and huge overpasses. Now, I was one of those street people. In the 80s, I lived under a bridge in Oakland, California, uh, in a box or a bag or whatever it was, or some kind of lean-to where the wind would stay out. And when it rained, it was awful, you know? It's just, this is my favorite weather now, the rainy outside, because I've always got a key to a place, you know? Uh, this week, it's not a nice place. Um, Evidently, the crew that's filming that paid for my lodging this week wanted to remind me of humble beginnings. So <laughs> we're back to the crack house motel there off of Katy. Uh, I don't want to mention names. I, I think that, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but I have a view from my hotel room of a nicer hotel. That's what you want, really. You know, it's just, <laughs> you look at the Sheridan and think, someday, man. Okay, uh, so we were driving in the car, it was almost lunchtime, I'm going uh, through, through the uh, Houston, and the driver, the club owner says, looks at some homeless people sleeping under the overpass. And he says, God, I wish they'd lock those people up, just get them off the street, it's hideous, I'm sorry about that, Mark. They don't know my history, right? The, the other guy on the passenger side, he goes, oh man, we gotta help them. You gotta help people like that. And my primary impression of that picture was, man, they, those folks, they sleep late. <laughs> you got panhandle to do, get up. You got a vagrancy ticket to fight. Come on, you just, you can't lay around all day. And then you get to the shelter and wonder why the soup's gone. Are you kidding me? No motivation, that's why you're under the bridge. And I remember being that guy. I remember being the homeless guy as opposed to the, the uh, uh, courageous, industrious, motivated addict that I was. We're not stupid, we're not worthless, we're not handicapped, we're selectively focused in our energy. <laughs> Think of the things you did really well a lot of that didn't do anything for you. We're really selective about, say, courage. At Courage at 19 years old, it's a dope deal down in East Oakland Alley. I'm going down at two in the morning, pale, no weapons, and 19 years old, 120 pounds. I'm going! Courage now at 53, eating barbecue ribs and a white shirt. That's it. That's it. Ooh, watch out. Oh, risky. 
because I'm OCD, you know what I mean? And if you're OCD, you know that CDO is a correct alphabetical sequence for those letters. But I'm OCD, I iron my socks. Uh, I don't like to touch people. I'm germaphobe, I'll shake hands in the lobby when we're done, and then I'll go wash up to my neck. Because you people are filthy, man. And I, I put it this way, OCD, I fold my jeans before I put them into the dryer. I just hate wrinkles, I hate them. Uh, and I'm getting older, I'm 53 and I got wrinkles now I didn't know that I had in certain places that... Let me move on. Um... You all right, ma'am? You okay? You all right? That's a painful thing to look at, isn't it? Yeah. Right, the wrinkles thing? I know, it's awful, right? Do you remember when you were a young person? Do you remember when you were younger? Do you remember when you were at that age, 17, 18 years old, and you took your bra off and they went up? Do you remember? I know, right? Look at the women in here. Oh my God. That's depressing. <laughs> Happens to everybody. I knew I was getting old when I was 40. I've always... <laughs> there are certain things where you know you're getting old. Where you know you're getting old. The, 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 the time that you realize, you know what, I'm listening to golf on the radio. <laughs> you're ancient if you listen to golf on the radio and turn it up so you can hear it when you're driving the car. It's a huge problem. Getting older, uh, uh, the first time I tried my CPAP machine on my face at night and, aww, right? Now, if you're a normal person and don't have sleep apnea, you know that a CPAP machine is something you don't understand. It's, <laughs> that's God's way of saying, use some of this, that'd be fine. I'd, a CPAP machine, continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP. CPAP, which it, it's, it's, a, it's, a tremendous, it's a hideous device. It's a cross between a snorkel and that Pulp Fiction ball gag you see at the end of the movie there. I go to bed at night, I'm scuba Bruce Willis, man. It's, but what it does is because sleep apnea, sleep, sleep apnea, there might be three groups of people in this room. Normal, the rest of us, and the steps don't help everyone, you know. <laughs> we lose a few, right? So, but if you have sleep apnea, it's, uh, you stop breathing. And you stop breathing, it's either uh, because we are overweight or uh, throat closes or some kind of, and if you stop breathing at night, it's not supposed to be good for you. I mean, oxygen turns out pretty useful. And, and you, I, I stop sleep, I stop breathing uh, 56 times an hour. That was what I was uh, uh, measured at, severe sleep apnea. And sleep apnea will lead to uh, uh, pre-Alzheimer's conditions and to have something else, I can't remember, but it's, it's, uh, it's not good for you. So it, it's this machine that basically just blows air up your nose all night, just And I was thinking, where was this when I was doing cocaine in the 80s? That was, what a great device it would have been back then to just blow, I, who needs to sleep, right? Just fill that thing full of coke and <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you remember cocaine and chewing on the side of your mouth for like an hour and a half? Thinking it was the bite of turkey that you took two hours ago, you remember? Happy holidays. And, uh, <laughs> So the CPAP machine, it's funny because it's not a sexy device at all. Nobody wants to hop on that guy, ever. It's, uh, you know, who's your stepdaddy? Right. No. <laughs> but being, <laughs> bless you, dear. That was. My disease isn't heroin, which was comforting or, um, Alcohol, which was necessary to put out the flame of shame for an abused five-year-old boy. Uh, a lot of us grew up in houses that were the most unsafe place in the neighborhood after dark, even an unsafe neighborhood. 
Um, but that being said, the house I lived in as a kid is not the one I'm going home to Friday night when I fly out of Texas. So there, there is change and there is, there is growth and there is a place of grace we're allowed to occupy, even though maybe it wasn't presented to us by our own families. And that's the separation tonight. Normal people had a, had a picture on the box of the jigsaw puzzle pieces they are. The rest of us, no picture. Or the picture didn't match the pieces. Try to put yourself together a piece at a time through your life and you go, I... This doesn't look like anything on that picture, that social drinker, that's not my puzzle. <laughs> you know, a, a healthy eater, oh no I did, right? <laughs> you know, it, my, my disease wasn't uh, methamphetamine, which is necessary if you had a job in the 80s, or, or uh, <laughs> addictions that I can't, I can't even, if we went into all the list of, of peripheral problems, those other lanes on the addiction highway that we've had, I mean, uh, smoking. Some of you will leave this theater, in the hour I'm up here, you'll leave the theater to go get fresh air through a filter. That's just what you'll do. And it makes sense to you. And because I mentioned it, some of you want to go sooner. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Or addictions to gambling. Addictions to shopping, addictions to work. Any outside influence that adds something to me I couldn't bring out of the puzzle box on my own. It just makes sense, but my disease isn't chemical. It's chemical. It's not substance abuse, it's abuse of substance. God made us perfectly broken. Fractured in my psyche, tender in my anatomy, fragile to chemistry, afraid of society, vocabularily challenged, financially irresponsible, spiritually retarded, and morally flexible. <laughs> Normal people know the names of everyone they've ever had sex with. Now you know who you are, don't you? <laughs> Look at the rest of us. Ooh, not in that category at all. I'd... Normal people must have great memories, I guess. Yeah, but... Well, they take notes on the nightstand every night, every weekend? They... Every once in a while, I'll see a tattoo that triggers me. Honest to God, I was in Miami a few weeks ago, and I saw a lady who had an eagle on her shoulder. I remember thinking, I've had one of those. It's just the way it goes, because my disease isn't out there. It's in here. My disease is first thought wrong. First thought wrong. Incorrect, impolite, inappropriate, cruel, self-centered, criminal, some form, fraction, even a sliver. First thought wrong. He made me perfectly broken so that I could heal along the way and pass on information to the next generation of perfectly broken family. The family we were born into and didn't choose. The ones we didn't pick that were related to by blood. First thought wrong. Sometimes second thought wronger. <laughs> Sometimes 15th thought wrongest yet. Slow down, cowboy. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Recalculating. <laughs> when possible, make an illegal U-turn, Mark, in your mental state. Recalculating. No, illegal U-turn. You don't have time for normal legal. In fact, criminal, remember, criminal doesn't mean bad. Criminal means caught. Normal people don't clap for that. They don't <laughs> clap for that. Normal people don't watch that show Cops and go, I did that too, right there. That. Run, my brother, whoa! Let's go, you can, I'm rooting for the naked guy. Normal people go, where are that fella's pants right there? <laughs> I'm almost afraid to stand in that spot, you know? First thought wrong says, You ever notice the TV you watch? That'll tell you who you are. The two words that should never go together. There are a bunch of words that should never go together. That oxymoronic system of language that we have. You know, like elective surgery. <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> Sober alcoholic. <laughs> Celibate hooker. It just, it just doesn't work, right? <laughs> Decaffeinated coffee. What the f no. First thing I did when I checked into the hotel was throw away the decaf packs. I don't want to accidentally use the decaf in the morning and go into seizure from withdrawal. From the... <laughs> Normal people drink decaffeinated coffee for no reason. I travel with a Keurig machine. You ever seen one of these Keurig machines? That's the coffee addict. Yeah! That's the coffee addict's version of a crack pipe right there. That's a one-hitter, man. Nice! Quick! 
I'll have two shots of that and then make a pot of coffee for the rest of the morning. <laughs> Keurig to get my groove on, it's a bumper. <laughs> Decaffeinated coffee, that's like the dope addict's version of being a bag licker after everyone's done. <laughs> that's a real specific reference, ma'am. Thank you for laughing at that. Bless you, you bag licker. Love it. It's okay now, right? We're all better. <laughs> I come from a dysfunctional family, severely dysfunctional. I'm the oldest of five kids. In our house, ADD stood for all different dads. And uh, <laughs> normal people go, aww. The rest of us go, I'm taking that to my home group, man. I'm gonna take that back to my home group. I hope you have one. Um, but I was, I was talking about first thought wrong and what a labor that is, even now, 24 years sober, uh, it doesn't guarantee me any kind of grace. It allows me though, to not be so confused about my part. That's all it does. That amount of time, I can tell you that 20 plus years in recovery means I've run out of excuses to behave badly. That's all it means if you're new. Don't get confused. It's not a better coin or a juice card out in public or a front seat in a plane all the time. I have some of that stuff, but that's because I'm more normal now than I used to be. You want to talk to normal people about growth? They're doing it all the time. They don't need steps. They don't go to meetings. They don't sponsor people. They are just honest without witnesses. They have a phone with no time limit. They got a key to a place where they decide to come and go. A fridge full of food they can access any time without penalty from the counselor. <laughs> they got kids they eat with every night. They do homework with. They've got uh, mail they read first. I mean, do you need anything more than that? <laughs> Those are my jail people. Mail they read first. Oh, man, that's a good gig. <laughs> now, if you're a normal person, some of that doesn't really seem like gifts. It just seems like the benefit or the byproduct of living a healthy, straight path to life, which is healthy and sound and honest. I will do a bunch of work tomorrow and the next day with a whole bunch of families who are confused. That's, that's what they are. They're, they're not bad people. Uh, they're not handicapped. The disease is in the mind, but I'll tell you, there's a whole bunch of confusion. Do you remember the mixed messages you got at home if you're one of the rest of us? If you don't look at it, it'll go away by itself. If you don't talk about it, it didn't happen. If you do talk about it, certainly you get more of it quicker. So don't do that. If you've got to keep it a secret today, don't do it at all. That'll change your whole life. That's not in the steps. That's not in the book. I do that. If I can't tell my five-year-old boy I did it on the road, I'm not doing it. Ever. That's, that, and that goes for everything you just thought of when I said that. <laughs> if I can't tell Grayson when I go home on Friday night that I did it on the road, I'm not doing it. I, I want to do it. <laughs> First thought wrong says, Daddy, likey. <laughs> I'm single. It's nice having attention on the road. But if I can't tell him about it, it ain't going to happen. I changed my whole life about 10 years ago. I just can't do it. My wife, my ex-wife, she's in recovery, 17 years clean. She's a goddess. I don't know a woman in recovery who's not a goddess. I know plenty of them that don't think they're unsettled for less. I know plenty of those used to be attractive to me. When I was new in recovery, somebody would say, what do you look for in a woman? Oh, low self-esteem. <laughs> Nothing hotter than somebody you can manipulate, man. That's bad stuff. That's good. Now, if you didn't laugh at that, you're one of those people. <laughs> and you know that. God gave you a humor muscle to highlight hurt. It's not my fault tonight. And if it's not my fault, it's not our future. You can't blame the person who brought the information. You can't do that. My intentions are pure tonight, harmless. But God gave you a humor muscle to exercise in times of stress to develop for places of balance in an unfair existence. Humor will highlight hurt, illuminate illness. That's what it does. So tonight, if you don't laugh, it's not because I wasn't funny, it's because you are broken. <laughs> Somewhere. If you don't laugh at anything tonight, you're severely handicapped with an atrophied humor muscle. I've seen it plenty of times. I've worked a bunch of corporate and military shows. Politically correct, 
G-rated, very unfunny crowd. Me, I'm hilarious all day, if I want to be. I don't always share it with people. First thought wrong says, <laughs> tell them, no. Especially with the boy, especially with the boy. He, he, I think all kids are little angels who just lost wings. That's why they don't walk fast in the beginning. They're, they're learning how to walk instead of fly or float. <laughs> What's your second thought? <laughs> Grayson's a good kid, but he's five, so he's irritating. <laughs> you ever try to speed them up when they're not ready to go quickly? You ever notice they have their own pace? And their pace slows down when yours quickens. The faster you want to go, the more games they want to play now. Look at a dead bee, yeah? You want to join them? You ever been so mad at your kid you want to punch your spouse in the face? Boom! What was that for? Well, I know it's wrong to hit him. CPS ain't going to take you away. Although, wouldn't that be a burden? <laughs> We're taking your spouse. Ooh, punish me. <laughs> Bring him back after Easter. We gave up sex for Lent anyway. We don't care. <laughs> I'll see you in May, baby girl, all right? Now, the funny part of that is you've been married a while. You don't give up sex for Lent. It's always Lent. <laughs> if you're new in a relationship, you still got hope. So Grayson's a good kid. I don't know a kid who's not. I don't know a child that wasn't blessed with energy and grace and love and spirit. And I think we dampen that. I think first thought wrong says control them, manipulate them into what I want. What I want, I want them to be happy. Now, because I'm codependent, I kind of want that. I'm kind of a helicopter parent. I, I get that. Uh, my wife, on the other hand, she's an ex-crankster. She doesn't care about anybody. But um, it's a, that's a joke. Let it go, for God's sake. So, you know, those cranksters, they don't really care about people. I'm still trying to figure out if there's a third or fourth group in this room. So Grayson, God bless him, he has a keen eye. He has a very crystal clear, unfractured lens to look at life. And I think all kids do. I think that's their gift to us back. I think really God gave them to us to care for for a while, but also to teach us. And man, I've learned more from him than I've taught him, my boy. My dad would beat you so hard with a piece of furniture or a, a something from the garage or something that came out of the engine of a car that you'd black out. And then he'd keep hitting you when you blacked out because he was offended. You couldn't stick around for the full beating. It bothered him that you would quit on him. He would scream at you as you blacked out. I remember that at four years old. Now, that being said, normal people never laugh right there. Normal people go, this is terrible. Here's the secret if you're new. Forgiving my father prevented me from becoming my father. I'm not the dad I had, so my son's not the boy I was. It's amazing. That's what the park does every day. Allow someone to change their mind so the next generation has the option to change. That's what they do, simple as that. It's not complicated. It, okay, yeah, sure, why not? Now, if you're an alum from the park, you know that that's a huge part of what they did for you. They gave you another choice. I have a whole bunch of stuff that my dad did to his kids repeatedly in the middle of the night that uh, I, are, are off the list of options for me. He did, did me a great service, my dad. He showed me what not to do every day. There's a whole bunch of knots that I don't do. There's a whole bunch of stuff I have no idea what to do, and that's the transitional fearful place for me is, geez, what, what, what options do I... Like, here's what I've learned about Grayson. He's got his own spirit. He's, he's an old soul. He's got an abstract quality that I have as a writer. He's got his mom's energy and drive, and she's a smart lady, very high IQ. Uh, my ex, she's got a master's degree in communication, which is redundant for a female, but he's got that too. <laughs> he's got... <laughs> 
it's always a little dangerous for me right there as a performer because the, 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 there's women in the audience who go, just when I was starting to like the guy. You know, it's just... <laughs> So, so Grayson, he's a challenge because he's five and because he's male and because he's, he's, cause he's got a mind of his own. You ever try to get him dressed when they don't feel like getting dressed? <laughs> I, I remember when he was a newborn, I told my wife, I said, listen, I'm not going to rush this process. I'm going to give him my full attention, let him know even though he can't speak to me. I can look at his eyes. The whole time I'm changing this diaper, I'm going to let him know he's a focus of my entire universe. <laughs> I know, right? Look at the women. So naive, so stupid. Just, what, were you drunk back then? I mean, yeah. So I would take my time. Pretty soon I realized, you know, the first time we were really in a hurry, my wife's going, Mark, come on, church, we, we, come on. And I'm getting ready, and he's like, this isn't how we do this. What the heck did I do? Like, it's like all of a sudden calf, calf roping, you know. He gets up, and he's all, you know. Right? Recently, he didn't want to put on his shoes, and they were Crocs. Does it get less complicated than Crocs? Not even real shoes. They're not a pump, they're not a sneaker, they're not a boot, they're not a sandal, they're some kind of rubberized Swiss cheese remnant piece of crap. Frankenstein footwear hybrid piece of just holy, the strap doesn't even matter. And he won't put them on. I guess I'm not really over it. Um, <laughs> but I said, put those shoes on. He goes, no. <sighs> My wife's down the hall. She goes, <laughs> I said, put the, put the, uh. <sighs> he goes, dad, you frustrated. <laughs> yeah, how'd you know that? Because you breathed. <laughs> when you're frustrated, you go, <sighs> and I do do that. I do do that. Do you know why? Because it works. It's not what I learned at home, but it's what I do in my home. It works. Take a breath. Take several if you have to. It fattens the filter between first thought wrong and next word spoken. Next action taken. Next step directed. Fat filter necessary if you're a parent. It just, especially if you're the rest of us. So I breathe, you know, I breathe. I said, buddy, I don't, I don't like the fact that you said no, but I understand. Here's the deal, all right? This is the deal, and we do this all the time. We have deals. If you ask him two, two things now, he'll say the same answer to both questions uh, uh, that, that we talk about all the time. Since he was an infant, I would tell him all the time, even when he was in her womb, I would tell her, our job is to take care of mama every day, all day. That's our job. Man, if you did that your whole life, Everything would, would have changed a long time ago. I am mean, not caretaking. I mean, taking care. So he knows that. What's our job? Take care of mom every day, all day. What's our deal? We never break our word. Right now, he'd tell you that if we called him. And on the West Coast, it's two hours earlier. He's not in bed yet. So I said to him, I said, listen, I, we got to get in the car to go to the game. You can't go to the game without shoes on. So you decide. Either you put shoes on and we can go to the game, or no shoes and we stay home. He goes, Dad, I want to go to the game. Put your shoes on. No. <laughs> My first thought is, why, why did I have sex with your mother? Ever. <laughs> Ever. My second thought was, I should have slept with her sister. She can't have kids, man. <laughs> and she's got a bigger rack. It's just a whole bunch of benefit there. You can't tell me at this point in the show that surprised you. So I said, I'm going to say one more thing. If you say no to me again, no game. You understand? If you say no again, no game. Put your shoes on. He goes, <clears throat> And I had to leave the room. I was laughing so hard. Because <laughs> I was so proud of him. Like, he didn't bend. He has a spine. And I, I, I felt like saying, boy." My wife goes, he's good, huh? He goes, way better than us. My wife and I, when we divorced, we made a calendar for him. And this is recent, too. We've only been apart since June this year. Um, but we made a calendar through the end of January. My schedule is anything but went one day at a time. I got bookings now into 2014. Um, Cadillac complaint, believe me. So I, we made a calendar for him, and we showed it to him, and we thought we had it all dialed in. You ever think you got it dialed in? It's just like no questions asked. You got it. Right? We worked on the calendar all Saturday. 
we showed it to him. And uh, he, looks at, he looks at June. And he looks at July. And we'd made a calendar. It was his calendar. Pink days are mommy days. Blue days are daddy days. And all the month is full of pink and blue days. He looks at us and goes, what, what color is all three of us? Day. I know. Never saw it coming. I looked at Julie and she goes. <laughs> and my first thought was, see, I should have slept with her sister. It's just. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, every day is a Grayson day. We didn't need to make a special color. Every day is your day. We're Team Grayson. He goes, Dad, how about Team Rhino? Out of nowhere, abstract. I'm thinking, that's a weed smoking kid right there. <laughs> right? But it's never fixed. It's never finished. And it's never, ever all dialed in. If you're new in recovery, what you need to understand is that nobody gets it all locked up tight and right. Nobody. The, 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 the recovery is not the absence of abnormal thinking or the disappearance of defective behavior. It's the ability to navigate through life without losing your place of grace or your recovery. Recovery is recommended. Being a human being, part of society, it's mandatory. Just we got better tools now. If you're new, you're in a great place. If you're an old timer, you're in a fantastic place. But recovery without steps is A, not recommended. B, passages in Malibu. <laughs> C, Charlie Sheen. Take your pick. It, it doesn't, it's just not recommended. So uh, I wasn't going to tell this story tonight, but I changed my mind because it's on film and I, I, I'm really not a, worrying about offended, offending the fractured people um, because I, I want this on film and some of them are leaving already. Okay, that's all right. That's, I have abandonment issues, sir. Oh, no, don't come back. Don't come back. Bless you. Oh, it's a blue day. All right, here we go. So <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's that's. Good. <laughs> it's a white Christmas. Okay. So, uh, all right, let me start over for content wise so that we don't have to edit this out. Um, Grayson has plenty of challenge for his dad and his mom. The fact that we're not together anymore means that we co parent. We're really good parents. We're really good people. We're no longer a couple. I get to teach him what it means to lose a partner without losing a friendship, how to lose my patience without losing my temper. How to have an argument and not be loud or unkind. I can do that. He watches that. We don't yell at our house. A, it frightens him. I don't want to frighten him. He's never scared of his dad. I didn't grow up in that house. I don't yell at his mother because, well, it was unproductive in the marriage. As it turns out. <laughs> a loud, arrogant husband is the number one cause of vaginal dryness in this country. That's a a medical fact right there. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that up to you whether or not it was worth the risk I took, but I, I think for most, <laughs> for most of the young men, I think it was worth the trip there because I, I, my, my hope, my hope is that now if you're offended by that, please email me. Don't bother the Memorial Hermann people. I, 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 I told him this would be PG, and technically that's within the rights of PG. You could put that on TV easily in PG fashion. I'm going to keep my word. I speak nine languages. They're all English. <laughs> but here's my hope, that when I take a risk like that, and I think outside the normal parameters of safe, that some young man in here will get that joke later at the right time. Where he's got his cockles up and he's ready to exercise his fiery furnace as a man. He's going to tell her, he's going to tell her because he knows he's right. And he's going to tell her, he's going to go, no, not today. <laughs> Today's Saturday. I got a promise. <laughs> to me, I hope it's worth it. Now, the risk I take with my boy is how much truth to tell him. How much truth do you tell the kids? Honesty without some kind of filter is poor judgment. Honesty without compassion is cruelty. And honesty without consideration for your surroundings is just plain stupid. So he asked us, uh, at one point, Julie and I, this is about three years ago, so it would have made him about two and a half. 
And uh, we were thinking about having another baby. And uh, uh, I was on the road. Sorry? That's funny to you? I thought you should have slept with her sister. <laughs> you thought I should have slept with her sister? I thought the same thing. All right. Here. Nice high five, baby. Right on. What are you doing later? I'm at La Quinta. Did I tell you that? Yeah. Look at you too, sister. I ain't prejudiced. Come on. Bring it with it. Let's go. Are you newcomers? See? 14th step. It's, it's all... Right? You're normal? Oh, you're far from normal. Are you all right? Bless you. You don't mind the attention, I can tell, right? No. So, because you're normal, let me, because God just whispered to me, go ahead, pursue. Not, not in the way I just was playing with, but this way. You ever snorted coke? Never? Where did you live? San Diego. They got coke in La Jolla. I've done coke in La Jolla. You ever smoke pot? Yeah. <laughs> and embarrassed about it in this group. In this group. That's normal. I take it back. I apologize. You're a normal person. Yeah. Yes, my freshman year in college, I smoked a little weed. I quit because I was getting bad grades. There are other schools, baby girl. What a quitter. Okay. So. <laughs> All right, let me go back to the show I wrote. It was fun talking to you guys, but um, my third thought is this. Um, the baby, right? At one point, Julie and I were considering having another, uh, another kid and uh, very passionate about it. She was, she really wanted another kid. And I think part of that in hindsight now, being in therapy, we've been married, we were married for seven years, we were in therapy for nine. That just lets you know something right there. I, a lot of red flags, I mean, about the relationship. You ever, you ever back off something and go, oh, I should have seen that? I knew, I should have known the marriage was coming to an end when, when at dinner one night she says to me, I hate the way you breathe. <laughs> what? I just hate the way you... <sighs> you breathe through your mouth and I hate the way you eat. The way you eat and the way you breathe. So without those two things, we'd be good. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Don't eat, don't breathe. Oh, good. The two basic things that guarantee my existence on this planet. Yeah, quit those two. My fifth thought is this. Um, <laughs> she got tired of waiting for her man to come home from his job. I've done this for over 20 years. I love what I do. But there's a payoff that requires a trade-off. Doesn't mean everybody has to make the same trade-off. So she got tired of that. And now we're not doing that. You know, we're not a couple. Um, I don't have to disclose that in the show, but it's to let some of the newer people know nobody's got it right all the time And because we don't do it well doesn't mean we don't benefit and because we do it perfectly doesn't mean we win So I come home from a road trip Grayson's about two and a half I think he's almost three at this point because he's very very loquacious He's a chatty kid and we're sitting at breakfast and I just come off a red-eye flight and I'm tired and my filter is thin when I'm tired and I haven't eaten, and I didn't sleep real well, and my filter gets brittle. You ever wake up in the morning and know it's gonna be a brittle filter day? You ever leave the house hoping somebody wrongs you somehow? Yeah. Oh God, I hope they cut me off in traffic. I will run right now. I got a piece of crap car, I will run into that Lexus and I will not look back. I don't even have liability insurance. They can pay for everything, and I don't have a license either, so who cares? man <laughs> sometimes when my fitter, filter is brittle first thought wrong is long and strong and will come back around you ever get rid of a first thought only to have it recycle <laughs> months later years later like hey, you know I should have slit her neck and watch her bleed into the sheets <laughs> I could buy new bedding I got a credit card I know where to hide a body I got buddies who will care I, I should have mm, man I know, I'll be working with families tomorrow and Thursday. Um, <laughs> look at normal people, good God. Park doesn't stand for recovery at all. So I, I just want you to know I'm fearless about what you think of me because I, I, I like what goes on. I know that the 
fragile mindset of the addict doesn't stop. That the tools are greater, the skill set is, is, is more full. And I can, I, I'm not afraid to share that with you. A couple things happened in the parking lot when I got here. Because I love you people, I said a little prayer. Because I know who you are, I locked my car. Everything happens for a reason. Okay. <laughs> I'm right where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right, take two. You okay, camera guy? You getting worn out there? Is your neck sore from, from doing that? You all right? You've been on your knees the whole show. You want to hear my first thought? Well, what was yours? What was your first thought? <laughs> oh, wow. All the normal people left to go smoke? What happened? All right. So I come home from a red-eye flight. My filter is brittle. My, my patience is wearing thin. And I've been gone five days, so I miss a lot in five days. At two and a half years old, they grow exponentially quickly, and the vocabulary is expanded, even in four or five days. So I said, how you doing, little prince? That's what I call him. He's got a bunch of nicknames. Jackson Brown, my favorite artist. Uh, Chowder, he's got a bunch of nicknames, you know. Um, uh, I, I said to him, I said, hey, little prince, how you doing? He goes, dad, I think I would like a baby sister. And I looked at Julie, and there's a, a look that passes between couples who've been around a long time together, done a lot of work together. A look is all you need, a look. And, and whatever couple you are, heterosexual, cool. Homosexual, cool. Bisexual, greedy. Stop, please. <laughs> Make a decision, you selfish whore. I'm not judging, I'm just saying. What, life's a buffet for you every time you leave the house. I'll have one of him, two of her, and all that big fella. Come on, let's go. Salad in the backyard. I got options. <laughs> First thought wrong, if you're just gay or just straight, you're just half the market, right? So, I looked at Julie and uh, what, what she did was she goes like this. Now, any wife in here, any partner in here knows that that means, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing thing. We've been talking about this. He wants a baby sister. She just, you know, it was emphasis. And I go, any married guy in here? You know, that, that's permission. Permission. Okay. You know, I didn't say a word. Just because he's eating his cereal, you know. She goes, oh, yeah. I said, buddy. I said, uh, does it have to be a baby sister? He goes, yeah, dad. I decided. I said, that's a lot of pressure on dad. You could do it, dad. I looked at Julie and she goes, So I said, do you know how, how we make a, a, a baby sister? Do you know how we do it? He goes, yeah, Dad, you have fertilizer. <laughs> you have fertilizer, Mom has an egg. And the egg and the fertilizer get together in Mommy's belly, and then the baby grows till it's time to come out. I looked at Julie, she goes. <laughs> That's wife speak for, see, stuff gets done when you're gone on the road. I'm working here. And I said, buddy, he goes, Dad, does Mom swallow the fertilizer? Julie goes. I said, not if you really want a baby sister. Julie goes. True story, just had to remember it the way it happened. We tell grace and things that we like to remember, and we do that for newcomers. If you're in recovery and you're newer, the things that people say to you are things that we live by. It's not for you to do and us to watch. It's for us to live through and pass on. That's it. Keep it simple, one day at a time, easy does it. Those things really do work. They really work. And other things that normal people tell their kids. We tell grace in certain things that are okay, some not okay, you know. Our deal is we don't break our word. I, we say this to them all the time. It's not your business, buddy. It's not your business, right? Because he's aware. 
It's not your business, kid. Dad, that girl had two pieces of cake. I only, that's not your business. Okay? Dad, but what if, it's not your business. You got it? Okay, Dad. All right, Dad. It's nobody's fault. We can tell him that. It's nobody's fault. We told him that since he was a little kid. It's nobody's fault. When we argue, we would always say to him, what's rule number one when mommy and daddy argue? It's not my fault, dad. Yeah. And he goes, whose fault is it? I go, sometimes it's nobody's. He goes, I thought it was yours. <laughs> I, swear to God. I said, why? He goes, because she was talking and you were talking too. <laughs> what? He goes, you have to listen when mama talks. <laughs> you ever want to loosen their car seat just a little bit? And then hit a pole. You ever want to do that? Just, just me? Okay. Well, there's a bunch of stuff that goes through my head that's vitriol. And it's verbal vomit if it comes out my face. And, and he doesn't have to wear any of that because I'm a good man. However, I don't think like one first. First thought wrong is not the death sentence it used to be. Not for anybody. But it doesn't go away. Freedom starts with forgiveness. There's permission to be okay with the way I think. I've never had to apologize for a thought. Never. I've made many amends for words or actions or lack of action or the wrong words. We curse at home, we just get creative. I like people who know that language isn't offensive, that it's the intent. There are no bad words on the planet. There are huge meaning behind them that we keep reacting to. If you don't like a word, don't be it. You are what you answer to. You know that. You can't pick a word that hurts my feelings. Not ever. Unless I volunteer to be the victim and let it sit up there. Fifteenth thought wrong? Yeah, I'm coming to your house. <laughs> That's how I think. I was in Cleveland recently and uh, I was doing a show. Thousand dollar plate fundraiser. And a uh, big ticket gig for this treatment center there. And the, the very upper crust elite, I'm uncomfortable in those settings. I, I play a lot of golf, but I don't belong to a country club. I fly in the front of the plane, but I usually get a free upgrade because I fly American totally all the time. I get privileges based on the fact that I do things a lot. Not because I have a lot of stuff. Julie and I right now live in two different places. We got rid of the house. We have two smaller places, and it's plenty. I can teach my boy how to lose something without feeling like a loser. It's an amazing thing to be able to show how we grow. He loves both places. He loves his mom. He adores his dad. Right now, he thinks I walk on water. When he's a teenager, he's going to want to hold my head under it until I can't breathe anymore. <laughs> no, that's coming. But for now, we curse at home. We just get creative, right? And I like people who don't mind a little bit of cursing. I didn't curse tonight, not one time, but at the end of the show, you'll think I did. <laughs> you will, you'll think I did, not one time. So along those lines, uh, I was working in Cleveland and the priest that was doing the uh, uh, benediction, the, the opening prayer for the evening, thousand dollar plate, black tie formal fundraiser, and I'm the entertainment. And I speak G. I work Fortune 500 companies. I do workshops for CEOs called Humor Begins and Ends with HR. <laughs> yeah. Whee! Thank you. I wrote that, right? And, and, and what I can tell them is how to be inappropriate and not pick up a tab for it with somebody who's really a PC or afraid, right? There's an inappropriate that's just inside the box. I learned that again from a Catholic priest who was opening the show, and I hated him. I hated him because they loved him. First thought wrong was they love this guy. He's a local. He's an icon. And I got to follow this guy. And all he's doing is saying a prayer. So he says, <laughs> right? Right? Insecure entertainer? That's like saying little midget or busy meth head or sleepy heroin fella, you know? <laughs> Angry lesbian. There's a bunch of redundancy, right? Gay priest. Come on, you guys. There's a bunch of them. So, oh, look at the time. So, <laughs> we're going to get you out of here just in time to go see some more lightning. All right? If you're a newcomer in a van, you're going to make curfew. Where are my halfway house or three quarter house people? By applause. By applause.
Uh, clearly. Okay, so we know you're here. Okay, so uh, listen, thanks for, for being honest about that. Here's what I'll tell you. I'm going to stop the priest story just for a second. And it doesn't make for a good film, but a lot of times I'm directed to stop whatever's going on for my purposes. And, and here's something for you guys. Uh, up, I, I got there, there, and there. That's anybody else that I missed? Transitional, right here. One guy. <laughs> Small house. <laughs> little Fiat brought you here, little white Fiat. <laughs> little Mini Cooper. And you pointed him out, sir. <laughs> Are you related to this gentleman? He's a good kid stuck to you. <laughs> so many issues in this room, I can't even tell you right now. It's just no, but no better crowd, high expectations, and no self-esteem. I love this group. Uh, bless you. I hope it's good for you. All right. I mean, whatever recovery is going on for you. How long have you been clean? Uh, Never mind. That's enough of an answer. Right there. That's enough of an answer. If you're up there, he goes, uh, that's, that's perfectly worded right there. I get it. Less than 15 days. That's all I got to know right there. Just, uh, you're not in court. You don't need to pause. You don't have to remember which lie you told yesterday. It just, uh, uh. How long have you been clean? Uh, what was your favorite drug? Uh, what'd you sound like your first night in jail? Uh, right? It's okay. It's all right. It'll get better. All right? Not hanging out with that guy, but it'll get better for you right there. All right? Here's the, the, the people who are in transitional housing or a, or a new environment or a halfway house or the place where you're living, that's the safest place you've ever been. That's the last time you ever got to ask for another chance. Do you know how liberating that is? You never have to start over ever again. But here's what you owe this group of people who paid money to see you. Now, your houses bought your tickets for you. I know that to be a fact. And bless them for doing that. Sorry? <laughs> you ever wish somebody would relapse right in front of you? You ever, you ever wish the theater you were working had a few less seats? You ever, you ever wish the van had broken down at 615? All right, brother, you're a good sport. Here's what I was trying to get to before you had to tell me I was right. Um, <laughs> you owe us. You owe me. You owe the people that bought your tickets. You owe this community. You owe us. All of us, not the normal, not the rest of us, you owe us. And the way you pay us back is the next time you don't want to give two minutes to somebody who needs two minutes of instruction or patience, you give it to them anyway. Pay us back. That will do more for you than you ever know. That's what you owe this group right here. So look at their faces in the lobby when you're running out to go smoke. Because <laughs> you still smoke. Don't give up smoking. You'll put a bullet in your eye, man. <laughs> smoking in porn. That's how we get through the first five years. Don't clap for that. Don't clap. Please. Look at the normal people. See, I knew they weren't all healthy. We go through a grieving process, right? A grieving process. And if you've ever been through grief, you know there's five stages of grief. Without telling you what you already know or being redundant, the five stages of grief, you have to go through them. Five awkward stages. Pride, gluttony, sloth, envy, and wrath. You got to get to wrath or there's no healing. Go right to wrath. <laughs> Wrath. 
No, I'm over 50. I know when you gotta pee, you gotta pee. <laughs> There's no holding it off anymore. There's no like, well, I'll just hold it back. And, no. There's people that gotta go now because I mentioned the word. <laughs> right? After 50, your bladder has ears on it. Your bladder sits down there in anonymity and goes, pee? Yes, now. Nah. You're young, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You, you don't remember the last time you urinated, probably July, you don't even know. <laughs> Prostate, isn't that laying prone? No. <laughs> I forgot what I was gonna say now. <laughs> you ever lose your train of thought? Uh... Oh, thank you. Bless you. So the priest, uh, his... No, they remember. Bless him, you know. You got a beautiful laugh. It's just really wickedly twisted. I hear that voice in my head when somebody falls off a curb. I'm not kidding, I hear <laughs> Are you okay? You all right? I was in Denver, and I, it was in the afternoon, and there was an old lady. She, she had to be like 60,000 years old. She fell off. She went to take a step and just wham! And she stopped, and her teeth did not. I'm not making it. I laughed so hard, I thought, I, I'm going to have a, a, a heart attack right now. I, the teeth just ch -ch 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 all the way across. <laughs> right in the crosswalk. They stayed right in between the lines. They made it to the other side. I'm not kidding. Her chin went boom, and they went ch -ch 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 -ch. I couldn't stop giggling. <laughs> ah, can I help you up there? I just, <laughs> woo, I just, first thought wrong was you, you, you got to bring her one plate back. That's all, one. <laughs> that was a gift from Jesus right there. Man. I was having a bad day. So, I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Priest, hurry up, come on, focus. We paid 90 minutes for parking. All right, the priest in Cleveland. So the priest, all he was gonna do was say a prayer. And my first thought was wrong. It was, it was petulant, it was childish, it was, it was immature and self-serving and like, they really liked this guy. And I had never worked for this particular elite part of the Cleveland crowd. And I was nervous, to be honest with you. And, and so he says, but before I pray, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a joke. And I thought, oh, you prick. I had no second thought. <laughs> you ever have one that's long, five, six minutes of just the same wrong, long, strong thought? <laughs> he smiles and they're happy and I'm in the back of the room and he says, uh, a bank robber walks into a bank and he's got no mask and he tells you, tells everybody, on the floor, on the floor, I'll shoot you dead where you stand. You look at me, I'll kill you in your face. I'll put the gun in your face and pull the trigger. My first thought was, I, I like this guy now. <laughs> Some of the people were going, oh my goodness, oh my, I'm like, and? <laughs> what happened? So, so the teller pops her head up and he pops her right in the face, shoots her dead where she stands. And the whole audience, ah, 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 and I'm going, yeah, go father. He says he walks over to grab some money and the manager looks up to save the teller and then and, and sees him and he, he shoots the manager right in the face. And as he's leaving, he says, anybody else, anybody else want to dare to take a look at me? And an old man in the corner, he pops up and he goes, I think my wife took a peek at you. <laughs> and I, and I, I couldn't stop giggling, right? I couldn't stop giggling. 
so he, he comes to the back of the room, and he, he comes to the back of the room, and uh, the MC's up there saying, now our entertainment for the night, it's going to be hard to follow that. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I just can't not like this guy. It was beautiful. It was irreverent. It wasn't what a Catholic priest would tell. It's a shoot the gun in the face, kill somebody story. And, and he's a man of the cloth and really good at his job and very iconic. And he comes back and he goes, I did that for you. I said, what? And he goes, I've seen your work. I know this crowd isn't your favorite. I've seen your videos. You do great work. I set the table for you. Eat. <laughs> yeah! What a kind gesture from that guy, you know? And I just, I, I said, first thought wrong, 15th thought wrong. After a while, I couldn't not like the guy. You know, he, he took a bullet, really, for me to do a good job and took a lot of walls down. Humor does that. God made it so that it will highlight where we're harmed or hurt or fractured. But humor has a way of attaching itself to a truth that makes it easier to approach, less threatening to digest, take away the stigma, tame the shame. He, he designed it perfectly. No greater evidence of that than a kid who laughs at what's funny without your permission. They're taught to pull back from true. It's amazing the freedom they have to laugh at what's genuine. Every year I do a music fest down in the Keys in Florida. I host the stage, a bunch of big bands and bigger names than me, and I just bring them up and I make announcements about corn dogs for a dollar and the bathroom's over there and we got a lost little kid and it's, his name's Johnny and he's right here. And I just host the stage for three or four days and Grayson goes with me every year. He loves my job. About two years ago, Julie and I were still married. Grayson was three and a half, and we were going down to the Keys in Florida from the Miami airport. It's an, it's an agonizing drive. It's got to be four hours from Miami to Key West. Four, four hours in a straight line. One lane this way, one lane that way. So you know, even before you get to the Key West, when you come back, you're going to see the same stuff with the same people for four hours more. I want to slit my neck and bleed into the bathtub. So Grayson goes, Dad, there's SeaWorld. See, it's Show World. Can we stop at Show World? Grayson goes, Dad, there's Show World. Can we stop at Show World? I said, on the way back, buddy, on the way back. And my wife did the thing that good wives do. She put her finger on my forearm. I was driving. She goes, that means don't forget. And I went, yeah. We get down there, Key West. I do the event on the way back. We're in a hurry. I'm always in a hurry to be somewhere, aren't you? You know, wherever I'm at, I got to be somewhere else. It's just that way. I just want to get to the airport and go home. I'm tired of people. You ever get tired of people? There's a lot of them. I don't have to talk to them all. You ever go someplace like a convention, 12-step recovery convention, just, it's just too much hugging by the second day? You're hugging the same people. It's like, we're, we're not learning anything here. It's just... You ever go to your home group or a meeting or a unity day or some kind of recovery celebration and you ask somebody how they're doing and they really tell you? Oh. How you doing? Well, I got this shit. No, I didn't mean how you doing. I mean, how you doing? So on the way back, I'm in a hurry, and my filter's thin, and I'm a little bowed in my spirit because I've put out a lot of energy to deal with people and be social. I'm afraid of groups. I'm uh, claustrophobic in a way, and I'm really, really, really antisocial or sociophobic because of the way I was raised. You don't know that tonight, because this I can do. Out there, I'm one of a bunch, and that's just the way I think. I'll be in the lobby after the show. I don't mind that. I can do it for another hour. I know what my reserve is. But I didn't have any left coming from Key West and we're driving up that little stinky one lane highway where all you see is bay and 
gas station and gas station and thrift shop and trailer park and show world. Gracie goes, Dad, there's show world. You said we'd stop. And I go, oh, man. First thought wrong, second thought wrong. Julie reaches over, she touches my arm, and I go, yeah, I know. <laughs> I didn't say it was a good filter. I just said I had one, right? Okay, okay, so we pull into Shell World, and there's these stairs going up, and a guy in a motorhome cuts me off, old guy. Why old people are allowed to drive motorhome, I have no <laughs> idea. They should be in a, in a, in a, on a bicycle or something safe to where if there was an accident, they die, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm not judging, I'm just saying. If you're an old person, you know. You know who you are. Don't rent a motorhome. Don't. This guy, he's driving, and he can't back up, and he cuts me off, and I go, cheese and rice, because that's how we curse at my house, cheese and rice. It sounds the same, it almost rhymes. It's just not toxic. <laughs> Grayson will say it, cheese and rice, dad. He could be ordering a burrito, nobody knows. <laughs> when I'm really upset, I say, son of a business major. He'll go, business major, dad. He thinks he got away with something, it's awesome. Business major, I go, hey, <laughs> good one, buddy. So the guy cuts me off in a motorhome and I stop the rental car. I go, cheese and rice. He goes, what happened, dad? I go, that guy cut me off. He goes, did he do it on purpose? What the, f no. <laughs> Mr. Forgive everyone immediately. I'm Adolf Hitler. I'm raising baby Buddha in the back seat there, man. He's just like, did he do it on purpose? And, no, my wife's going. <laughs> So I want to kill two people hitting the pole with no airbag, right? I knew it. I knew it. So to distract myself from the carnage, which is this guy trying to put it in reverse and drive and put it in reverse, and he's going two inches forward, two inches back, and I can't go anywhere. And I'm, I, I just hate him. I look away. One of the shortcuts, if you're new in recovery, is what you give energy to will continue in any direction. Whew. Attracted to distracted, I make it work for me. I look out the window. There's a woman going up the stairs into show world. She's got to be 500 pounds. I'm not judging, I'm just saying. She's a big person. She's wearing a pair of shorts that belong to a woman who's about 150 pounds. I, I know, I'm, I know and I cannot tear my eyes away from the circus that is her rear end going everywhere up the stairs. Cheese and rice. Julie goes, what? And I pull my head back, I go, she goes, oh my. <laughs> From the back seat, we hear, dad, that's not your business. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.